So it's July 18th, Tuesday, July 18th, 2017. And I've been working for the last few days on the eighth lecture in my series, The Psychological Significance of the Biblical Stories. And I'm planning to talk about the Abrahamic stories that immediately follow the stories of Noah and the Tower of Babel. I'm not as familiar with the Abrahamic stories as I am with the stories, the earlier stories in Genesis, say from the beginning of the Bible through the stories of Noah and the Tower of Babel. And I'm not as familiar with the Abrahamic stories as I am with the stories of Moses that begin with Exodus and continue in the succeeding chapters. So I've had to do a lot of reading and a lot of thinking and and some conversing as well. And as part of that process, I spoke once again with Jonathan Paggio, a, a carver of stone icons and uh, an Orthodox Christian and student of religion. And also this time, who, who I did a video with a while back, you might remember, called The Metaphysics of Pepe, where we discussed the psychology of the stranger and also some of the stories, the Abrahamic stories involving Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. And I also had the opportunity to meet his brother, Matthew Pajot, who's been working on a book on the Bible for the last three and a half years. And so we spent 90 minutes talking about the Abrahamic stories and the conceptual background that's necessary to understand them. And that's what I want to um, show you today uh, after this introduction. So I hope it's useful. So I'm going to introduce both of you. So Jonathan is a carver of icons, and I've spoken with Jonathan a number of times already, and he now has his own YouTube channel as well, where he discusses issues that are similar to the ones that we're going to discuss today. And Matthew is his brother, who I haven't met before this day, and Matthew has been working on a book for the last how long? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. And do you want to tell everyone very briefly about the book? Well, it's a book about symbolism, but it's, it's basically I'm trying to rediscover the worldview that was present in, in the time of the Bible, or at least actually not that long ago, because modern, modern interpretations of reality, materialist interpretations of reality aren't that old. So right. um, the worldview that was there when traditional societies were still there, um, and so I'm trying to rediscover that worldview, and uh, basically, there are basic patterns: heaven and earth, time and space, things like things like that. Uh, so it's like a, a cosmology that's been completely lost, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, some people uh, have glimpses of it. I think a lot of people do, but it it's very general patterns that we have to re re understand so we can understand the Bible, for example, and other. Other stories, so, so other why did you stories. get interested in this? Like, what is it that's compelled you to do this? Oh, <laughs> I don't know where to start. I mean, my whole life has been about that. So, uh, I mean, you read the Bible, you can take it literally, you can take it figuratively, or you can take it both ways. And I'm trying to take it both ways. I'm trying to get rid of that dichotomy, the dichotomy of symbolism yeah. and factual description. I think there is no such dichotomy. If you understand what the words mean, if you have the right perspective, there's no more metaphors in the Bible. There are none. Okay. But it takes a while to get there because you have to adopt a completely different perspective than, than a materialistic one, obviously. You can't be a materialist and, and a Christian, or you can't be religious and a materialist. That's what I think. Okay. And one, one of the things we're hoping is that you know, we've been getting, I've been getting a lot of questions, and I, pr I know you've probably, Jordan, been getting a lot of questions about this question of metaphor. And a lot of people have been asking me, how do we reconcile, how do I reconcile metaphors with what's in the Bible? How do I reconcile these metaphors with how I'm supposed to live in the world? And I think that what Matthew's been, is writing, and what I've been, I've been reading it, right, I'm reading it right now, is that he, he's really able to answer that question in a way that I think will be one of the most satisfying answers that we've seen in in a while so we're we're pretty excited to see how we're going to get that out to people so let me start by telling you what i've been thinking about just briefly and then you guys can comment and i'd like you to do most of the talking if we can manage that although i'm so damn talkative it's hard to imagine that'll happen but so i've been reading this book called the disappearance of god and i've been using it as a it's by a guy named Richard Friedman, and it was published, I think, in 2005. I think that's right. Um, it might have been earlier than that. But he makes a couple of interesting points about 
the old the writing in the Old Testament and and they're parallel points and so the first is that the closer you are to the beginning of the Bible the more God is present and and as you progress towards the end of the Old Testament God sort of vanishes in stages until he only manifests himself if at all in prophetic visions and at the same time the parallel development is that the stories of the individual human beings become more and more well developed so it's like as the idea of the individual personality emerges or the fact of the individual personality emerges the the presence of god as a as a detectable entity like an external entity even seems to decline proportionately and so i'm trying to puzzle that out in a variety of different ways partly neurologically because there's some evidence that the domain of experience that you might associate it with might associate with the divine is a consequence of suppressed left hemisphere function and augmented right hemisphere function and then i'm trying to also consider that in relationship to the effect of chemicals like psilocybin which obviously can produce powerful mystical experiences so experiences of consciousness that are really of a different type than normal waking ego consciousness and i've also been reading jung's uh mostly commentaries about jung's red book and his attempts to use active imagination as a as a means to explore the contents of different forms of consciousness which is something that modern people just really never do although he did it for years and and the consequence of that was the red book also the black books which haven't been published yet but the red book which was a uh which was i think published two or three years ago it was a collection of visionary experiences and his his continuing discussions with figures of his imagination which he regarded as the most important work he did in his life so so what's what does that all boil down to it's it's definitely possible for people to have non can ha to have experiences outside the domain of their normal consciousness that produce the intimation of the divine that seems to be factually indisputable those we're not exactly sure how those experiences manifested themselves in the periods of time that are associated with the early biblical stories the bit the bible talks about those sorts of experiences very forthrightly in the earliest abrahamic stories and also in the story of noah and obviously in adam and eve and all of that god's very present and then he disappears over time and one of the things that that um the guy who wrote the disappearance of god friedman one of the things he pointed out was that the fact of the disappearance of god in the old testament the fact that that's a that's con that's a continual like it has narrative continuity that fact and he really remarked on both those things because of course the books were written by different people and then they were aggregated but out of that came two elements of narrative continuity and one was the gradual disappearance of god and the other was the gradual rise of the increasingly well-defined and powerful individual so anyways associated with that is the idea that as god withdraws he also starts to manifest himself more through the idea of a covenant and that the covenant is something that's established with an individual it's all obviously also with a nation in the case of israel but it's mediated through individuals and so well that's a brief wander through the sort of cloud of associations that make up my thinking about the topic at the moment so well, what, what you described sounds a lot like what, what you see in the Bible. I, I'm not so sure about the God is more distant part, and further on it goes. Um, from what I understand, there, there are two uh, kinds of consciousness in the Bible. One of them is, it's called inhabiting the land. That's when um, reality fits the, the, the theory, okay? So the principle and the fact agree. So there are laws, and people follow the laws, okay? Or there's an idea, and reality fits with that idea. So that's called inhabiting the land. So it, it, it's familiar space. Okay. So when you live in that space, things make sense, because 
your ideas match what's happening. Right. And then you can fall away from that, and that's the covenant, okay? A covenant is an agreement between theory and practice. That's what a covenant is in the Bible. Um, so God gives laws, and the people have to agree to follow the laws, basically. So the law is 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 an identity. It's not just like you do this, you do that. It's it it expresses God's identity in practice. So when the facts match that identity, that's like a soul and a body that are uh, that agree. Okay. So when you fall away from that, you fall into exile. That's the other mode. Yeah. And it it looks like. Um, that's what you were talking about before. I'm not so sure until you talked about a covenant, but um, that's when the meaning and the facts do not match. Okay, so so let me let me ask you a couple of questions about that. Yeah. So, you know, I've been describing the cosmology in the Bible as mappable onto the domains of order and chaos, and I actually think the best way to define order is order is the place you are when what you're doing matches what's happening. Yeah, exactly. So it's very, very, very similar to the idea that you just yeah. expressed. And then that's the, exactly it. Okay, okay. And yeah, that that's a state there's a state of harmony between preconception and actuality. And that's also, mm -hmm. I think, this the circumstances under which people's emotions remain regulated. And I thought about that neurologically too. I think that what happens is that under those conditions your left hemisphere stays in charge. And there's some evidence for that kind of thing, too, especially from the writings of this neurologist. Uh, I think he's a neurologist. His name is Ramachandran. He's quite a famous um, brain scientist. And he's a, and a, another, another neuropsychologist named Al Conan Goldberg, who's also talked about hemispheric function in the same way. And so when things are going according to plan, let's say, yeah, you're in exactly. order. And then the, the individual ego consciousness that's, that's focused and specific stays in charge but that also keeps negative emotions regulated because there's no need for them because everything is working properly and so then you can fall out of that and you called that you called that exile no uh when you fall away from it yeah, yeah. when you fall away from that exile. It. Yeah. so that would be equivalent yeah. it's to, also the flood it's, it's also, also the, the flood. flood yeah fine okay yeah, sure. and so the exile is like the wandering in the desert yeah or yeah. it's the the idea of exile is it's exactly just what we said. It's about serving strange things. So you're not in charge anymore of the right. facts. Something else is, but you're in. You're in that. Uh, you live in in a world where you are not in charge, or your identity is not in charge of the facts, and they're not. They don't fit with reality. So that means something else is in charge, and so you're serving that. So right. the idea of serving strangers in exile, it simply means oh, that's really your cool. identity doesn't match reality. Oh, that's really Somebody good. Else. I never thought about that, that idea of ser serving strangers in exile. So, so okay, so I'm going to branch off that a, a couple of different ways. So one idea there is that there's a, an idea from Jung, which is paraphrased something like, if you don't, if you don't act out your own myth, then you serve the, a bit part in the myths of others. Okay, so that would yeah. be in keeping with that idea of serving the stranger in exile. And then the next part would be, when you're in a chaotic state, and your emotions are dysregulated, your personality fractionates, and the fractionated personality, personalities, sub-personalities, fight for control over, over, over behavioral output. So you, you, you dissolve from a unity, you might have think about it as a pyramid, a pyramid with, with a unifying conception at the top, that disintegrates, that would be like the Tower of Babel to some degree, that disintegrates and then sub-entities, you could think about them as spirits or think about them as psychological entities, regulate your behavior. And that would be equivalent, I think, to a movement from the left hemisphere to the right, because I think the right is dominated by subcortical structures, rather. I think that's how the animals exist, is, is it's, it's sequential domination by subcortical structures rather than some overarching conceptualization from the top down. I think that um, what you call the left and the right is exactly the opposite of the traditional left and right. I'm not so sure yet, but when you say left hemisphere, what do you mean? Well, the, what, left, like hemisphere, what's... the left hemisphere governs the right hand. Okay. 
So the left hemisphere is the one that's when it's when it's in charge and when everything works. Yes. Okay. It's the right. So hand. it's exactly the opposite of the of the traditional imagery. Usually, the it's the right that's well, yeah, because they're using the hands. They're not talking yeah, about the brain. Yeah, exactly, so. exactly. So the right, yeah. it, the right would be mapped onto the left hemisphere. Okay. So, so that's okay. fine. So that's fine. That and and the traditional imagery I think is associated with the hemispheric specialization as well. Because the idea of right, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to ask you a question about that. You said that the 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 living. What was it? You you contrasted exile with what was the other conceptualization? Inhabiting the homeland. In, inhabit inhabiting the homeland. Sure, absolutely. Or wor working on the home. Working yeah. on the homeland is also another way to say. It. Okay, now tell me again how you conceptualized. The relationship between God and and His people, let's say, in the homeland. So, uh, okay. Well, God, like I said uh, at the beginning, there's the idea of heaven and earth is is at the basis of everything in the Bible. So, heaven is meaning, and earth is fact. So, in that relationship, there's um, God. It's always the name of God, by the way. If you look, if you look in the way it's described in the Bible, it's it's they're talking about the name of God. So that that means the meaning of God. So God is not just meaning, but when they talk about it in the Bible, it's always about the name of God. So the name of God is is an identity. It's like a principle, an axiom, or something like that, and um, it has to embody itself in. Uh, physical reality, in flesh, or in matter. So uh, the 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 role of the nation of Israel is to embody that identity, and it's also to embody it in reality, not just in themselves. So basically, they're a mediator between heaven and earth. Right. They're trying to make God's identity um, practical or. Uh, concrete or that's why it's all about laws because you take an app it's like mathematics you take an app uh, an abstract principle that's really extremely simple uh, it doesn't seem like it, it contains much information right if you take an axiom in mathematics but then you have to derive all the implications right so that's making it practical that's making it concrete that's bringing heaven into the earth so that's their job <laughs> yeah it's like a cosmic mediator Okay. Between. Okay. F follow you so far. So, all right. So, the, the. It looks like there's two ways, maybe, in the biblical. Narrative that, that will is instantiated in in reality, and one would be. As a consequence of individuals aligning themselves with the word of God, and the other is, the instantiation of, the word of God into the state of Israel. Okay. Seem seem reasonable. Okay, and that seems to begin, that that has its origin in the in the first Abrahamic story. So Abraham talks to God, and or God talks to Abraham and tells him that he's going to be the father of a nation, essentially, and then. He's going to inherit the land too. That's right. important. It's the same thing, actually. <laughs> Those two things are the same. He's going to inherit the land, and he's going yep. to become the principal of. A great many people, so that's like he's fleshing out an identity, right? And it gives a nation instead of just an individual, right? And he's going to become the identity of a nation. Okay, and so how do you understand the description of that in the in the biblical narrative? Because one of the very one of the things I find very strange about the Abrahamic stories is that immediate presence of God. And God shows up to Abraham and tells him this, and then Abraham makes an altar, if I remember correctly. Once he gets to the land where he's supposed to be, he makes an altar, and then... And then God appears to him again. Yeah, uh, not so, again. Not again. He appears to him. The first time he doesn't appear, I think, I'm pretty sure. Okay. The first time God speaks to him. Okay. See, that's okay. that's important. Okay. And the why, second why time, is that distinction important? Well, because he's just word. He's just 
he's not physical. He's not uh, into practical reality yet. It's invisible. So God speaks. He's not manifest. It's just a, an idea, a principle, a word, okay? An unmanifest word, or it's like the minimum of manifestation. It's like just language, just word. And then, so what he says is, go to this place, go to this land, and you'll inherit the land. And then he goes there, and then he says, God appeared to him. I see. see so, so, okay, so there's a, there's a progression, progressive in, there's a prof progressive appearance of God, and it's partly a consequence of Abraham's original um, obedience to the initial idea. Yeah, which was very abstract. I mean, <laughs> go here. You can't be more simple than that. Go there. So it's, it's like, it doesn't mean anything, but it means everything. It, it's a very, everything we do is a go there. You know, go right. there and do something. Right. So it's like the principle of all things appeared to Abraham saying, just go there and you'll inherit. That doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> it contains everything humans do. Yeah, okay, that, that's an interesting observation because, you know, I, I think of human beings as, well, they're very directional. They're always going from point A to point B. They're always yeah. aiming. They're like archers, right? And it, it's definitely the case. Like I had someone write to me, no, I was doing a Patreon interview with one of the people who's, who've been um, supporting me, a young guy. And uh, we were talking about the idea of Christ as redeemer and judge. And he was, this young man was unredeemed, let's say, for a long period of time because he didn't have any direction. And to have direction, you have to know what's good and what isn't because to have direction, you have to go towards what's good. And so the judge is what helps you figure out what's good. And if you don't know what's good, then you can't be redeemed. Because to be redeemed is to be, is to be moving towards the good and away from, let's say, evil. And mm -hmm. so the judge and the redeemer have to be the same thing. And that fits in with what you're saying because the judge is the thing that makes qualitative distinctions, let's say. And mm -hmm. you need to make a qualitative distinction before you can move ahead. Okay, and so your point is that the, the, the principle that Abraham encounters to begin with is the, the principle of directionality itself, qualitative directionality. It's something like that. Is that yeah, correct? It, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's the positive identity of anything. Like, it's, it's like a seed. It's like the seed of a tree. That's, that's the, the traditional way to understand it. It's just a seed. Yep. It contains everything in it, but in itself, it's just something like go there or something. Go there. Okay, okay. So that's in, okay. So one of the things that's been interesting, I think, for me to learn personally as I've moved through my life was that if I ever actually did anything, it was worthwhile. Yeah. You, you, you know what I mean? Is that something would come of it. It wouldn't necessarily be what I expected to come of it, but the yeah. act of going and doing did yeah. bear fruit. Yeah, and that's pretty much the story of Abraham in a nutshell, actually, what you just said. Because God says, go here, you'll inherit the land. Abraham doesn't inherit the land. I mean, he could have been right away, he could have gone there, and it's yours. Right. But no, there, there's, that's why it says, as soon as he gets there, it says, there's already people there. There's, the land is already owned by right. other people. Right, and so, then there's a famine. Yeah, exactly, and, and that means... It means, like what I was saying before, the facts support the theory, okay? And here he's going to the land, that's the theory, you'll inherit, yeah. that's the theory. And the facts don't support it, that's a famine, okay? The earth doesn't support you. The earth doesn't give you sustenance to make it reality. It doesn't give you matter. Yeah. It gives yeah, you matter that... He ends up in Egypt and, I mean, his wife is separated becomes, from him essentially yeah. because he lies about her. But then it's so strange because, so he, he tells the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh's men that his wife is actually a sister, that Sarai yeah. is, Sarai, is that how you say that? Yeah, yeah, Sarai, before she changes her name, yeah. Yes, is actually his sister, and, yeah. the, the, and that's to protect him, and so the Pharaoh takes Sarai, and then okay. God... Okay, uh, can I explain something? You bet. There's a meaning to all of those things, there's a meaning to it. Okay. So, the idea is that when... Fact, uh, facts support the theory, okay, when, when the flesh supports the identity or the matter, or heaven, earth supports heaven, things are square, 
okay? That's just a traditional way of understanding it. That basically means that what you see is what you get, okay? It's, it's truth. Things are true. That's the definition of meaning matches fact. It's yeah. true. Okay, fine. That's when, a good pragmatic definition. Yeah. When, yeah. when the other side happens, then things are round. They're, they're cyclical. Okay, and it's 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 essentially it's time, it's space and time. That's what it is. Okay, one of them, you're falling into time. Things are not square. That means things do not the the meaning doesn't match the fact. That's why it's all about lies. Okay, when they go into exile, it's all about lies. It's all about dreaming. Okay, um, because they're in that domain. They're in a domain where meaning and fact doesn't match. So. Everything happens through lies and deception. And even the whole idea of um, saying my wife is my sister, that, that represents a, a cyclical paradox. Okay, okay. okay why? It's not supposed why to happen. Well, why cyclical? Um, your a parent has a son and a daughter, and they get married. It's like a regression, okay? It's like you're, you're producing different things and then you're joining them back together. You're not supposed to join them back together because when you join them back together, it's like you're going, you're regressing. When you, when you build something, you start from principle and you develop it, okay? You make specializations of that principle. When you start to mix them up again, it's like a regression. You're, you're going back to something more primitive than before. Okay, Does that how make do sense? You see that? How do you see that in relationship to Abraham's insistence that Sarai is his... Is his uh, sister? Sister, yeah. Because you're not supposed to marry your sister. And I'm not saying that as a moralistic thing, even though it becomes one. But the reason you shouldn't marry your sister is because you're undoing the work the specializations that your 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 father or your mother ha have created it's like going back it's like regressing so like if you marry your your father or your mother or depending uh, you're going back it's a cycle you're not supposed okay. to do that because it's like you're annihilating something that was specified Okay, look, okay. I'll give you an example, like an imagery of that. That's that's pretty important in, in, in the story of the flood. There are traditions that the giants created hybrids. Okay? Yep. One of the things the giants like to do is create hybrids. They're, they are hybrids themselves, but they created hybrids. They took the species and they confused them back into who knows what. Okay? And that's very significant because it, it actually means that you are regressing in a confused manner okay that there's a connection between the flood and what i just said making hybrids and causing the flood it's actually considered one and the same thing does that make it sense makes some sense yeah I, it's, I, a, it's about returning to confusion yeah look look i'll say it this way adam okay. names the animals yep. adam adam names the animals okay god Ask Adam to name the animal. It's his first job in the universe. So he's asking him to specify different things, okay, that are all all have the same source. Right. It's the to same differentiate as them. Yep. differentiate. That's the idea of incarnating a principle into practice. Yep. Things get differentiated. Okay. Now if you reverse that process, you're going back to a more primitive level. You're going back to the flood. Because the flood is the most primitive thing in in that cosmology. Right. It starts with a flooded world. That means everything's in confusion. So what you have to okay. do is specify things out. But if okay. you go back, does that make sense? <laughs> okay. So so let let me let me reformulate that and tell yeah. you what popped into mind. All right. So God gives Abraham the word, and then Abraham follows it, and God manifests Himself more completely to Abraham, and then. What happens to Abraham is twofold. He ends up in a barren land, so nature rebels, and he also ends up in a tyranny. Right? Because he it's not only not only does the land not produce, so it's in a famine, but Egypt mm -hmm. eventually Egypt is generally speaking 
a symbol for, for tyranny throughout the initial parts of the Old Testament. I mean, you see that with the Pharaoh, for example, and, and the symbolism in, in the Mosaic story of, of, the, of Egypt always being associated with stone instead of water. And so you could say that God gives Abraham the command to move forward, but he has to contend with the intransigency of nature, which rejects him because there's a famine, and then he becomes, subjugate, sub, he becomes subject to both tyranny and to deceit. And so okay, maybe, deceit, think about, well, deceit go, go and ahead. tyranny are, uh, look, okay, I'll say it this way. It's, it's more about deceit than tyranny, okay? But the thing is, when you're not in charge, I mean, there's your tyranny, that's it. When you're, you or whoever you identify with is not in charge, you're, you're a slave to some other principle. Right. You're embodying some other will that's not you. I mean, that's tyranny, right? I mean, <laughs> so right. in that sense, it's relate, directly related to the idea of tyranny. You're serving strangers. Right. It says it all, actually. Well, that also, motivates, that also motivates Abraham's deception, right? Because he's terrified that the strangers that he's serving will kill him. Yeah, for his wife. For his wife, and that's why he lies. <laughs> he's, he's afraid that he's going to be treated very badly. Yeah, because he doesn't want strangers to have his wife. Okay, His wife is like the earth. His wife is how he will incarnate himself or, or express himself yeah. in the world. He's like the seed, and the wife is like the, 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 the earth, something like that. So she's the, she is like his earth. It's like a miniature version of heaven and earth. The male is, 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 is the heaven and the female is the earth. In that case, that's the whole idea. He's not in charge of facts anymore. That includes his wife. That includes... Right. So he doesn't want other men, other principles, to control his wife. Right. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes. Well, it also, it also seems to me that because he's, the land isn't fruitful for him and because he's serving strangers in a strange land, he's also correct to be afraid for the loss yes. of his wife. Yeah. And how does he get out of it? By being deceitful. Because yes. he's in the cycle. He's in that... I mean, are you supposed to be truthful with your adversary? Usually, no. Uh, especially when your adversary is hostile. I mean, if you're in enemy territory, your morality changes because all of a sudden... <laughs> It's not about being truthful. It's about surviving. It's about, it's like the most primitive existence there is. Right. The more primitive uh, states of existence are more about deceit than about truth. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's an advanced, it's an advanced state to talk about truth. It's when we all agree, you know, we all agree on at least something. But before that, it's every man or woman from him or herself. Right. Right. And it's all about deceit. It's all about survival. Okay. Okay, so now, now the next thing that happens, essentially, is that the Pharaoh gets plagued, and he's wondering why. So, because, so the story indicates that the Pharaoh has broken some natural law, let's say, or some divine law, and things go very badly for him, and then he discovers, I don't remember how, he discovers that he's taken Sarai, Sarai. I think it, it doesn't say how. Yeah, I, don't I think, think it's that's says. right. Yeah. And, and he discovers that he's taken Sarai, but that Sarai is Abraham's wife. And so then the Pharaoh gives Abraham all sorts of goods and yeah. sends him on his way. Okay, so that's also quite confusing. So Abraham is rewarded for his deceit, yeah. essentially. Ill, Ill gotten goods, yeah. Right. Ill gotten yeah. goods. Yeah, but it's it, part it of the story. <laughs> it's yeah, part of the story. It's interesting because you, you also see, I think, in that account, some of the complexity that's embedded in the in the Old Testament accounts is that it's not a simple morality tale by any stretch of the imagination. You especially see that in the Abrahamic accounts because um, it's Jacob who who's so deceitful with Esau. I mean, Esau comes off. I mean, he's yeah. he's kind of he's kind of unconscious. Esau. Yeah. He gives things up too easily. He's too easily deceived, and he's a bit prim. I guess he's a bit too primitive and a bit too. Naive, something like that. But Jacob plays, and Rachel play some really nasty tricks on him, and yet they come out ahead. 
Yeah. And so that's also a very difficult thing to contend with. Well, there's there's this idea, at least in, in, in traditional interpretation, there's this idea that um, Esau is actually supposed to be the, the king. He, he should be. The only reason he isn't is because there's something wrong. That's pretty much described the whole Bible in its entirety. The, there's, there's the theory and the fact. The fact is supposed to be king. Okay? Do you know what I mean by that? Like, uh, matter is king. It, that's what it's supposed to be. But it's not. And the whole, all the stories are about redeeming, redeeming that problem. Taking care of that problem. It's like the facts don't match the theory. We have to redeem the facts. That's that's pretty much all the stories in the Bible are about that. And that's pretty much what Lot represents in the story of Abraham as well. Okay. He represents uh, material reality. He represents facts. But there's okay, something so wrong with in, it. Let's go into the the Lot story now. So okay. Yeah. So Abraham leaves, and. I believe he leaves with Lot, yeah. and and Lot also becomes quite wealthy, and they go back to where Abraham had built the altar initially, but Lot, Lot's men and Abraham's men start to fight, yeah. so they decide they're going to separate, and they basically do that somewhat arbitrarily. It could could have gone either way, but Lot ends up going to Sodom. Well, actually. Um there's something you should be aware of. Uh, well, that's the, that's the thing. A lot of the, the stories in the Bible are are based on a really ancient way of thinking that we don't really uh, follow anymore. But I mean, in in the Bible, there is a reason why um, the directions of the travels they're not just random. Like Egypt represents the earth, and um, what's the name of the city? Uh, what's the name of the place above? Haran, I think, the place where he goes to meet um, Laban, uh, it's in the north. Okay, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. I remember the name of the sea. I think it's Haran. That represents heaven. Okay, and there's a reason. It's not just arbitrary. It's because Egypt is south, and south is going down. Right. We still it, say that when, when, when you say that someone's gone south, we say that means that they've gone to seed or they've gone down. Yeah. So, so in the Bible. In, especially in Genesis, especially in Genesis, um, the south represents the earth and the north represents the heavens, okay? And like I said, it's not arbitrary. It, it corresponds to the geography of, of the region. One of them goes uphill, the other one goes downhill. In the north, there's mountains, like snowy mountains, and in the south, there's uh, Egypt, which is like the low, yeah, a low place. And Right, so uh, north literally is up. Yeah, it's not a metaphor. Yeah, <laughs> it, it literally is close, going, getting closer to heaven, and the other one is going into the earth. So when they go in exile into Egypt, there it actually means they're going into the earth. It's like a descent into the earth. So it's like right. death. It's death. Right. And and they say it a few times in the book of Genesis. They talk about you're. It's like dying, going it going to Egypt is like a death. Okay. So then. Now, so then we we move to the story of of um, the strangers, right? Wait, Matthew, you were gonna say why the the separation of the land with Lot and uh, and Abraham? Oh yes, right. The idea is that Lot takes the 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 south, right, and then Abraham takes yeah, the north. Yeah, that was the whole point of that. Yeah, okay. Lot. There's a reason why he takes the south. It's the lowest place on earth. Sodom and Gomorrah, that, that place. It's the lowest place. Okay, so Lot I think ends it up is the literally place. the lowest place on earth. Right? I'm not sure about I that. I don't know. I don't know. I think that region actually is the lowest place on earth. But in the story, that that's how that's what it means. It means it's the lowest place you can go. So it's, it's the like place the, that's farthest away from heaven. Yeah, it's the it's okay, the so bottom that's sort of the earth. like the idea that Milton develops with regards to Satan when he's thrown from heaven because the hell that Satan inhabits is the furthest possible away from heaven. That's how yeah. it's defined, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a journey into the earth. Okay. It's it's the same as, um, it means the same thing as, as falling asleep. Exile and sleep are the same in the Bible. 
sleep is, okay. is a form of exile. Okay. Exile so, is. So, so the next thing that happens is that we get the first warning about Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. That's just a very brief sentence. It's like a uh, foreshadowing. And then the next thing that happens is that there's an episode where there is a war among kings. And the, the kings, if I remember correctly, it's the king of Sodom, takes Lot. And Abraham has to go rescue him. And he does that successfully. I think it's the other way around. I think it's kings from the north that come down and uh, take Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot is part of that. And so is the king, the king of Sodom and Gomorrah. They have to flee. That's what I remember. Okay, do they flee with, do they flee with Lot? No, Lot is taken by these kings from the north. And um, the king of Sodom, I think, hides or something like that, flees. And then yeah, Abraham... Because the king, the king of Sodom at the end gives gifts to Abraham to thank him that he took That he rescued him, him, basically. Yes, that's right. So what happens is that... Yeah, it says, in, and it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, etc., that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, etc. And these were all joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is in the Salt Sea, which is the Salt Sea. So I presume that would be the Dead Sea, and that would be yeah, the, the low Dead point, Sea. The low point that you're describing. The lowest exactly. point on earth is the Dead Sea. So yeah. that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And. Um, the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they took away all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals, and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who, dealt in, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. So, You can really see this whole geography that Matthew's talking about when they say that Sodom and Gomorrah, they had to flee and fall into slime pits. It's almost like they're laying it out for us, that they had to almost kind of go even further down into the earth to hide from these... These, uh, these invaders of the north that are coming to take their, their land. So, okay, so Abram goes and rescues Lot, and he does that successfully. And, the, and also there's, there's kings that he, that he frees, as far as I can tell. Yeah, and probably. And then the kings want to reward him. And Abram says to the king of Sodom that he doesn't want any reward. And the reason he doesn't want any reward, except for what his men have eaten, he doesn't want any reward because I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me. And it looks, see, God has already promised Abraham everything in some sense, and it looks like he doesn't want to take anything, and that Abraham doesn't want to take anything from anyone else, because what would it what to do? Would it interfere with the purity of his accomplishments? Something like that? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know for certain, because um, that's just a line, I guess, but in the in the story, I mean, it's it's not that much of a big a part of the story, but the way I see it is, I think he says, I don't want to take even a, a shoe lash, a yep. shoe latch from you, okay? Yep, exactly. <laughs> so there's a reason why he says that, because the shoe is is the lowest part, is the lowest um, clothing, right? It, it, it's oh. on the feet. So it's all related to the idea that the, the earth needs to be redeemed, need, needs to be rectified. And it, it in that situation, it's not. It's like he's not allowed to accept. It, it's the same thing as not eating the forbidden fruit. There are things in the world that are poisonous to humans. We can't eat them because they don't agree with our... Our patterns, our, our 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 mind. So if you eat poison, you go into that uh, place where things don't agree. Your mind and your body don't agree. I mean, if you if you if you take if you drink uh, alcohol, um, that takes you into the realm where your mind and your body don't agree. The theory doesn't match the fact, and then you go into that whole confusion. Estos, could it be that when when um, he doesn't Abraham, want he doesn't want to take from Sodom because Sodom is already what we know Sodom to be. I mean, it yeah. it already represents kind of the the land that can't hold and will be burned it's, off. Yeah, it's something he can't 
he can't integrate. Right. It's something it's like that's why I said the forbidden fruit. It you don't want to eat, you don't want to accept matter that you can't handle, that you can't integrate. So there's something in that place that he doesn't know how to deal with, what to do with it. And he yep. doesn't want his riches to come from that place. Right. He does, right. He doesn't want his riches to come from that place. Yeah, because yep. it would compromise him. Because he doesn't know how to deal with it yet. Maybe someday he will. That's right. I think that's the whole idea. <laughs> and actually, here's an interpretation. Lot represents that place that will one day be redeemed. Okay. The, the reason why they talk about Lot so much in the story of Abraham is because he represents King David. Like he is the ancestor of the nation that will give rise to King David. Okay, it's like a secondary story within the story, but it's like a it's it's meant to be interpreted in terms of a future redemption of that place that he can't handle, that Abraham couldn't handle at that time. And that place will be redeemed. I'm giving you a lot of tradition here, but <laughs> This is what I what I what I've learned. It's King David, okay? It's the future king. Okay, so, so the so whole story of Lot is about King David. Well, and, and of course, Lot is Abraham's descendant as well, because he's his nephew. Yeah. And so it's well, a Abraham's nephew descends into the lowest place, essentially. Yeah. Well, look, it, it, the story starts out pretty clear. It starts out there's three sons to uh, Terah. One of them is Haran, the other one's Nahor, and the other one's Abraham, okay? Haran dies. That's how the, the story starts, okay? That's like the beginning of the story is Haran dies, and he has a son called Lot. See? Yeah. That's what I was... It, the idea is, it's the same idea. The son of this Haran, he, he represents death. He represents the thing we can't handle. He represents the material facts that we can't explain with a, with our theories or with our identity. He's the thing we he's the matter we can't handle. Okay? And that's why the story starts with he dies. The father of Lot dies. It means Lot represents some fact that we cannot correctly integrate into our universe. You know, it, this could be interpreted in so many different levels, but um, that's basically what it is. I don't know if that makes sense, but the idea, the, I mean, the idea is that is the. I think we need to see it. The idea is that uh, an orphan or a widow, that's what they always represent. They they represent yeah. something that have exactly. lost their their principle that unifies them. They're yes. they're they're kind of they're the, disconnected from the hierarchy of the family. So, so, so Lot losing his, the, the fact that losing Lot's his father. father dies means that he loses the thing that gives him identity. And so he's like this, he's like a, a, okay. a piece of earth that has lost attachment or has lost meaning. Okay. Or is, well, that, that reminds me of what happens to um, Noah's son who sees him naked. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and laughs. Related. Because... Yeah. because to see, it seems to me, I want to talk about this a little bit tonight, that to see <coughs> Noah gets drunk and then, which which son is it? Um, Ham. Ham. Ham, yeah. Um, really, first sees him, but doesn't respond properly. The other sons, when they see Noah naked, they cover him up and they don't look. And so it's like they're not exposing their father's weakness, his mortality, his, his, his insufficiency. Right, they and retain respect, but but Ham doesn't do that. But there's also more. What Matthew was talking about before, there in that story, there's two things that are implied of what Matthew was talking about before. This idea of wine that brings you into this cycle where causality ceases to be uh, direct, and then what Ham, the, the fact, yeah, yeah, and and the fact that Ham sees his father naked, he discovers his nakedness is also a a, a, a kind of suggestion of incest as well the same type the same type of 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 inappropriate causality that you mm -hmm. see in the story of the two of a uh, of a uh, abraham's sister marrying his sister right, right. So yeah and of lot with his two daughters right. yeah and lot with his two daughters right, right so it's transgression against some fun transgression against some fundamental boundary 
Yeah, against the the hierarchical relationship in, of a family. Right. You, right. You're not supposed to make loops. So it's, it's a tree. And you're not supposed to make loops in a tree. So you can say it like that. It's really simple. <laughs> you're not supposed to regress. You're not supposed to. You produce things. You're not supposed to turn back on yourself. Okay. You're not supposed to go back. Contradict that's, yourself. That's, okay. So so maybe that's why Lot's wife is turned into a pillar of salt. Because she okay. looks back, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it she, has to do with looking she's back. She's sentimental for sure. and and uh, and and pines for something that that was terrible that shouldn't have been. And so, and she's commanded not to look back once she once you escape from that catastrophe, you don't get to be nostalgic for it. The same thing happens in the story of Moses because what happens to the Israelites when they're out in the desert is they start to become yeah. nostalgic for Egypt, for the tyranny. Yeah. Right, and that's also, I think, when God starts to send poisonous snakes among them. Because, right, don't they, they, they start to pine for Egypt and complain about Moses. And then they start to worship other idols. So that's part of that confusion that you were talking about. And then God yeah. gets irritated and throws a bunch of poisonous snakes in there to give them a good chomping. Yeah. So that's well, the, the, the snakes come as a result of them wanting to go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, right. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So, and you see that nostalgia for tyranny, you know, you see that in the Soviet Union or in Russia right now, mm -hmm. with regards to Stalin. And so the question, the question is, I think this is one of the things that um, the guy who wrote The Disappearance of God mentioned is, do you want to be well fed as a slave or hungry in freedom? Something like that. And the choice well fed as a slave is not a good choice. Yeah. So, okay, now, so when Jonathan, you and I had talked a fair bit about the story of, of Abraham and the strangers mm -hmm. before. So, um, so God decides to reward Abraham, and he tells him that, just like he told him before, but he repeats it, that he's going to be the, uh, the founder of a nation. And he, and he tells him that, Sarah is going to bear a child. And Sarah, of course, is not, doesn't believe that. Let's see, let me, let me just find this here. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's what happens, is, the, is that God's, God, God's word comes into Abraham in a vision. So it's the word again saying that his reward will be great and that he's going to um, be the father of nations. But he doesn't have any children. And so isn't that when he takes... He takes Sarah's servant. Hagar. Yeah. And, and that gives rise to Ishmael. Mm. And it isn't until later that Sarah is informed that she's Here going to... Here is what I found. Sorry. Sarah... <laughs> Sarah, Google Sarah wants to is answer, listening. She wants to answer your question. She wants to answer your question. I'd be, I'd be curious yeah. to know what she has found. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should look. Yeah, I, I, I closed her down. Yeah, I know. It's a pretty, pretty strange intermission there. So, okay, so, so Abraham has to take kind of a detour in order to have a child. And he lays with Hagar. And Hagar, uh, we don't know much about her, but she gets haughty right away and starts to despise Sarai and Sarai actually beats her as far as I can tell it says Sarah dealt hardly with her and then Hagar flees and she ends up by a well where an angel appears to her and uh, the angel tells her that her son her child is going to be the father of a nation as well so, so the first question might be, why is it that Abraham, at this point in the story, why is it necessary for the story that Abraham takes a detour and has a child with Hagar? What do you think I that think, signifies? It's, it's, it's always the same problem in the Bible. It's always, it starts with confusion and it has to develop towards something that is uh, clear. So 
you're, you're saying it yourself when you say detour. Yeah, it's a detour. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's a detour. Okay. That's not necessary, but it happens. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, okay. I mean, so, isn't there something? That's what detours, detours are. Detours yep. are things yep. that are not necessary, but happen. Okay. But there's something also in that detour, the fact that, that he gives birth to Ishmael, which has to do with this, this turning, because God kind of promises that Ishmael is going to come back and he's going to be a big problem for you. He's going to be a father of, of a great nation, but he's going to be a big problem for you later. Like it's going to be, there's going to be fighting between between your sons, basically. Yeah, there's that idea. Yeah, of course. Yeah, also, <laughs> now, I don't know if it's in that story, but yeah, well, later. it also seems to be associated with an idea that you might think about as successive approximation to an ideal. You know, so one of the things that that I've conceptualized sort of visually is, and this is associated with the idea of Geppetto wishing on a star. You know, so what Geppetto does when he wants to facilitate the transformation of Pinocchio is lift his eyes up to the highest thing that he can conceive of and orients himself with that. But the, the thing is, is that as you move through life, let's say you're oriented by the highest thing you can conceive of, but as you move towards it, you transform and then and your conceptualization of what's the highest shifts as you transform. So you're aiming at the highest thing, but but your perhaps your ability to conceptualize what's the highest thing develops as you move towards it. And so, but what that means in practice is that you do take detours because you aim at something, but your aim is off and you move towards it. And then you get to a point where you can correct your aim. And so it's not like you've made a mistake exactly. It's you're farther ahead than you were. And you've corrected your aim, but your aim wasn't, you weren't aiming at exactly the right thing to begin with. Yeah. And so I think, that, you, yeah, go ahead. Well, maybe that's what's happening to Abraham is that, you know, you could almost say, I don't know, that Ishmael's a practice run, something like that. Well, <laughs> so, all right. So then you were going to, you, Matthew, you were going to say something about that. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that exile in the Bible, um, there's always a, a, a reason for it, but it's not necessarily a logical reason. It's, it's, it's just like what you described. You think you know something. You, you think you know what you're aiming at. You think you know what you want. You think you know what you're doing. Something happens that you didn't uh, plan, and that doesn't look like it's part of what you were aiming it makes you take a detour. Well, this, this site is all about detours. It's all about turning around. You don't know where you're going. You're lost. So, but in the end, it, it brings about something that maybe you weren't even aiming at in the, in the, in the first place, Yeah. but might be better than what you were aiming at in the first place. So it's not all bad. So I think that's the idea. The idea of the whole idea of exile is that there it renews your plans. Right. If you don't die. Yeah, if you don't die. Yeah, that's important to mention. Yeah. yeah. Even if you do die, it renews your plans. Well, actually. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So now, okay. So now the next thing that happens is that um, the strangers come to visit Abraham and he treats them hospitably. And so now we might say that that's an indication of his increasing alignment with the good. Maybe that's one way of thinking about it. Because he does right by the stranger. And one of the consequences of that is that the angels, I guess we find out that they're angels, tell him that Sarah is going to give birth to someone. And Abraham finds that very difficult to believe. And Sarah finds it so difficult to believe that she actually laughs about it. She overhears it and she laughs about it. But, but he he has the strangers, he feeds them, and he has them wash their feet, if I remember correctly. And um, anyways, he treats them hospitably and well. And there's a blessing as a consequence of that. And that's something we talked about a fair bit, Jonathan, when we were talking about um, the thing the that doesn't fit in categories. Yeah. The stranger, yeah. Which is that invitation to chaos as well that you were talking about, Matthew, because the stranger is... Well, the thing that you can be subjugated to, but also something that will bring something new and potentially disruptive, but also potentially beneficial. And so then the idea there is whether or not 
the stranger is disruptive or beneficial depends to a large degree on how you treat the stranger. And that's that yeah. strikes me as very, very possible. I mean, that's the one thing that, that that's one of the things that has really entered my imagination as a clinician. You know, if you're approached by someone who's very in chaos, the consequence of that is very dependent on how you interact with them. Because it can go any way. And they're not really in control because they're so chaotic. And so if you're careful and awake, you can keep things moving in the proper direction and maybe even benefit from it. And that's kind of like the idea of, of Noah walking with God because one of the reasons that Noah gets through the flood is because he's oriented properly. He's walking with God. And so you could say that exile can, it's something like exile can expand you if you stay properly oriented mm -hmm. while you're in exile. Yeah. It, can fi it can fix your mistakes. Uh, that's part of it. It cleans you. It renews you. Because you make mistakes, yeah. and they become part of you. And if you're you're stuck with your mistakes, you're rigid about your own mistakes. You need something outer, to something that you don't know, something that you don't understand, to clean your right. mistakes away. Yeah, well, that's like the gold the dragon hoards, or the virgin that the dragon hoards, right? It's, it's if the dragon represents that chaotic, let's say, exile state, the drag, or the gold and the and the virgin both represent that which can be assimilated as a consequence of being in that situation. The funny thing is, is in the hero myths, going into exile on purpose works way better than going into exile accidentally. <laughs> so that's an interesting thing. So, okay, okay, so now... Well, can I say something about yes. the, the part you were describing? The, the whole story of Abraham, if you look at the big picture, it's really about progressive, uh, progressively knowing something. So. It starts with just the voice, okay, of God, go here, doesn't mean much, goes there. Then he becomes a little more precise. I will give you this land. So now he's more specific. And then as the further he goes, the more it becomes ex explicit what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a son. When? I don't know. Someday. It doesn't say. Later on, it becomes more and more explicit, okay? And he says, like in the, the, the part you were talking about, he says... Um, three men come, these are angels, as, as it becomes clearer later, so this is God. It's right. God sending his message in a clear manner, and it's more right. specific than before. He says, this time next year, you will have a son. Okay, so, okay, so a couple of things about that. So, yeah. well, one of the things that, see... One of the ways that I've conceptualized the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I, this is kind of a classic Christian conceptualization, I think, and it's also, it's also analogous to what happens to Moses, because Moses doesn't get to the Promised Land. So there's this idea, Christian idea, that the reason that Moses can't get to the Promised Land is because he only represents the law. Now, but then I thought about that. I thought, well, one of the... Uh, I've got to say about four stories at the same time here to, <laughs> to get the parallelism yeah. right. So the first is, it's not so easy to speak the truth, but it's fairly easy to stop lying. And so as you stop lying, you get better, you get to approximate speaking the truth. But the way you start isn't by speaking the truth. The way you start is by stopping lying. And then a lot of the rules in the Old Testament are prohibitions. Here's a bunch of things you shouldn't do that you might be inclined to do. And so the idea there would be, if you stop doing all the things you know you shouldn't do, then you can, your head clears up enough so you can start to see the things that you should do. And so then in the Abrahamic story, maybe it's something like this. You said, you implied, Matthew, that Abraham originally follows something like a vague and ill-defined whim, but he has enough faith to move forward, despite the fact that it's vague and ill-defined. And then as a consequence of moving forward, it becomes more and more concretized and and differentiated and clear okay that's right man because that's you know it's funny because the future authoring program we've developed is sort of predicated on that idea the first thing you do is wander around in a kind of confused daze trying to yeah. find a direction of orientation and then you clarify that and and partly you do that by continuing to think about it but you also clarify it by acting on it yeah. okay yeah
And the, the idea, the, these three men that come visit him, um, there's a reason why there's three. <laughs> okay. It's because it, it's, it's trying to express the idea that it's more expressed. It's more explicit. It's not just a seed anymore. It's, a, it's like a branch. Okay, you've got a, okay. you've got something that looks like a branch. It's branching out into a more okay. concrete thing. And th at first, it's just a voice. Then it's a vision. Then it's actual people. Okay. So, okay. 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 So here's another idea. So let's say if you're beginning to develop morality, you you behave so that the people who share your morality can get along with you. That means you follow the rules. But if you're dealing with strangers, it's a different issue because they aren't part of your morality. And so the question then is, how do you act properly when you're not in the domain of your morality? And I always thought about that as a metamoral domain. And it, it seems to me that it's the domain that Christ occupies because he's, he's like the mediator between moralities. He's in no man's land. And is the mediator between moralities, and and if you're, if you're, if you've oriented yourself properly, then you even know how to act when there aren't any rules, and that's why Abraham can act properly in relationship to the strangers. He's awake enough so that when the strangers show up, shows up, he can pay attention to the way they're acting, and can act spontaneously as a consequence of paying attention, and things go well, and so the strangers aren't hostile, they don't kill him, they don't take his wife, they don't do any of the terrible things that strangers could do, and he gets a blessing as a consequence of it. Does that seem reasonable? Um, it is, but we have to understand that these strangers are come from heaven in the sense that they're bringing a message. They're not just random strangers, they're, right. they're sent. But maybe he would have acted the same way with a stranger that wasn't sent. And that's the whole point. He doesn't know. That's right. So he acts in a way that allows for that, yeah. Yeah, for the exactly. one that's acts, sent okay, to be received. So, okay, so that's very interesting, too, because one of the things that I think you see happening as a consequence of the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament is that part of Christ's message is to act in exactly that way is to act in a manner that allows for the possibility of the emergence of the good. That's something like, that's something like, what would you describe it as? A description of the necessity of faith. And you know, like let's say you stretch out your hand to someone in trust. You shouldn't be naive. But it's a precondition for good things happening. Like if you're distrustful, and you have every reason to be, because people are full of snakes, if you're distrustful, you, you foreclose the opportunity for cooperative progress instantly. You might protect yourself against being bitten now and then. So, so there is a dramatic relationship between the manner in which you open yourself up to the world and the way the world treats you. And one of the things that seems to be really emphasized, it's more implicit in the Old Testament, more explicit in the New Testament, is that the more you open yourself up to the possibility that good things will happen, and that's partly by accepting your vulnerability, as far as I can tell, the higher the probability is that good things will in fact happen. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say that in the story of, of Abraham, the like we were kind of flirting around that idea before, is that the reason why he was able to, to receive them as these angels, that they were able to manifest themselves as these angels, was because he was willing to host them properly. He, he right. like, it's as if his family... Just like Sarah, like Sarah is is is, he was the right ground for that manifestation at that time. Right. Well, you I might even say that they wouldn't have been angels if he wouldn't have treated them properly. Well, they might have been yeah. angels, but they might have done they might have done what they did in Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. Exactly. That's the whole <laughs> okay. point. That's the whole point. <laughs> okay. So now I want to switch. I want to flip ahead a little bit. And this is really what I. This is I think of all the things I wanted to discuss with you guys. I think this is the one that's most crucial. Because, uh, okay, so now we're in, let's say we're in Sodom with the, with the angels. And we're, we're in the part of the story where the townspeople of Sodom gather around the house. And they tell Lot that unless he throws out the strangers so that they can be raped, well, the, 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 the townspeople demand that. And then um, Lot offers them his daughters, which seems like 
a hell of a thing to do. It's like the sacrifice of, of, of Isaac to some degree. That's what it looks like to me, because he's willing to sacrifice his daughters to protect the strangers. Now, okay, so that's a morally, let's call that a morally ambiguous element of the story. <laughs> but then the townspeople reject that. And they, they, tell, they basically tell him that he has no right or power to bargain, and that not only are they going to take his daughters, but they're also going to take the strangers. So it doesn't work. But, you know, to, a, to modern sensibility, the offering of his daughters is a reprehensible thing. But it seems to me that in the context of the story, it's an indication of how hard Lot is trying to treat the strangers properly in a place where that's essentially impossible. Yeah, that's the whole point of that story. That place is impossible. That's the whole point, I think, what ah, you just said. Okay. There's no way out of it. Right. Leonard Cohn said something about that. He said there's, he had a line that I remembered quite well. He said, uh, there's no decent place to stand in a massacre. And yeah. what that seems to mean is that something, it's something like you can get into a place where that's made of such a compound of errors and deceit and catastrophe that no matter which way you turn, there is no good. Yeah. I've seen people like that in my clinical practice. There's, there's no good. There's no good alternative. Everything is sin. That's a, that's a good way of, no matter which way you shoot, you're, you're not going to hit the mark. Because you're not somewhere where the mark can be hit. Okay, now, I've been trying to think about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in relationship to modern sexual confusion. So this is what I see happening on the social justice front, let's say. On the one hand, since the 1960s, and probably as a consequence of the birth control pill, but other factors as well, there's been tremendous stress placed on sexual liberation. And so there's this idea that I think is associated in large part right now with the radical left of total sexual freedom. But at the same time, there's increasing emphasis from exactly the same sources on restricting sexual interaction. So you see this in the campuses, for example, where increasingly, particularly heterosexual contact is regulated by a doctrine that says you have to get spoken permission for every move in the mating uh, process. And so you see, and I know I'm not expressing myself very well, but there seems to be, in our current culture, there seems to be massive sexual confusion. It's, it's some weird combination of extreme libertinism and extreme authoritarian attitudes towards sexuality. And, yeah. and obviously in the story of Sodom, part of what's happening, happening is that sex, impulsive sexual gratification trumps everything. It's something like that. I mean, I know there's more to what's going on in Sodom than that, but there's certainly that. And so, well... I'm trying to figure out what to say about that tonight, because <laughs> there's, a, there's a lesson in there. The lesson is something like, don't let sexuality, don't let impulsive sexuality get the upper hand. It's something like that, or all hell will break loose, which I actually happen to agree with. So one of the things that we haven't been able to talk about in our culture, I think, is let's take the idea of the, the phenomena of AIDS. Like AIDS mutated to take advantage of promiscuous sexuality. And that's just nothing. You never hear that publicized. You know, people had associated AIDS with homosexuality. And there was a reason for that, because it's much more easily transmitted as a consequence of homosexual sex than heterosexual sex. Um, because the anus is a much more delicate physiological structure. It's not as robust, and it can be much more easily damaged and, and, and with, with disease resulting as a consequence. But... It isn't only the manner of sexual action that's the issue, it's also the fact that promiscuity provided the evolutionary platform for the AIDS virus to mutate into a very, into the form that it finally took. And it was only through the, by the skin of our teeth that we escaped a totalizing plague. You know, had that emerged a hundred years ago, God only knows how many people would have died. This AIDS was unbelievably fatal. So, I know that's a mishmash of ideas, and I'm not exactly sure how to see my way clear through it, but there is a clear warning in that story about, about something, about something yeah. to do with, with, with sexual iniquity. And Look, in, in the Bible, the sexuality has two 
two poles that define it. Um, it's pretty clear. One, one side is reproduction and the other side is, we could, let's say, recreation. Okay? So those are the two poles of sexuality in a normal world. So it's not just for reproduction and it's not just for recreation. It's both. That, right. that was the idea. I mean, it's right. a natural idea. Now, if you, if there's a balance there that, yep. that should be had, if you lose this balance and it becomes just about reproduction, that's a problem. And if it becomes just about recreation, that's another problem. Yep. Okay. It's, it's not that complicated really, but it's so politically incorrect to talk about these things, even though they're obvious well, they that are. nobody well, dares to talk thing, about it. The thing is, is that the most difficult things to talk about are the things that are obvious because when they're obvious, you don't have to talk about them. And so then when people start to question the obvious, you don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, it's like, exactly. so, so for example, we would, I, I'm thinking about the slut walks, you know. And so women go out and they dress very provocatively and, and they go out and manifest their right to be as provocative as they possibly can be without being interfered with. And I have some sympathy for that perspective because it seems to me appropriate for women to be the final arbiters in sexual contact. But on the other hand, it also, it's that whole exercise is blind to the fact that clothing, for example, has communicative intent and that people broadcast their invitation to sexual congress in a million ways, subtle and not so subtle. And you can't just say, I have the right to broadcast myself in any manner possible and be completely um, can, can, can be what completely immune from the consequences there's something wrong with that and with regards to basic sexual morality you know I've read things about like slut shaming is that the, the more radical feminist types for example claim that women shouldn't be held responsible for their sexual behavior in some sense it shouldn't be held against them how many men they've slept with etc but then I think well you'd never recommend to someone that they lay down naked on the on the side of the street with their legs spread and invite anybody who walks by to partake of the opportunity. Everyone would regard that as inappropriate, I think without question. And so what that indicates is that some degree of sexual propriety is both normative and ethical. And then of course you can start asking yourself about what that degree of social sexual propriety should be and it does have something to do with getting the balance between reproduction and recreation right. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the thing, even in the Bible, there's, there's the two aspects. Some stories are about just this aspect. And there are the most strange stories in the Bible. Uh, for example, the story of um, Tamar um, is one of those. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that story. But Not it's, enough. It's in the it's it's intercut with the story of Joseph, okay, in Egypt, and it's essentially uh, it says that Judah um, had children with some woman, and I think it's a stranger. It doesn't necessarily say so, but it, it seems like that's what it is. And then the sons die off, and then there's this woman called Tamar, and she disguises herself as a prostitute. Great. And she has a, a kid with Judah himself. So all yes. the symbols are, are he, in that story. Does she take elements of his clothing? Yeah. To demonstrate? As a, as a bribe, yeah, essentially. <laughs> well, and she wants to indicate later that he's the one who slept with her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that story is about the, the need for the recreative part of sexuality. It, 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 it's all about that symbolism. It's all about deceit. It's all about incest. It's all about death, and it's the, the idea is it's to raise the dead. Okay, it's not clear in the story, but if you under, if you understand the imagery, that's what it's about. It's about regressing back to an error that was made. Okay, and raising the dead. So I don't, I don't want to get into it, but okay. it's just the idea that in the Bible there's both too. There's reproduction and there's Recreation and the recreation is renewal. There's the renewal. Sexuality is about renewal too. But that aspect of the symbolism is is 
pretty, I don't want to say obscure because it's actually right there if you can see it, but it's, it's strange. I'll say it like that. It's a strange. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now another element of this might be the fact that in modern identity politics, sexual choice is a canonical identifier. And that also seems to me to be something wrong about that. Like one of the things I've seen happening in Toronto, I'm, I'm sure it's the same in Montreal, is that, and I'm, I'm going to do this awkwardly, I'm going to put this awkwardly because I, I haven't been able to sort through it properly. Um, Pride Week, Pride Day has turned into Pride Week and that's turned into Pride Month. And I think that seems to me to be pushing against some kind of limit because the first question that I have is, like I was reading this book the other day by a friend of mine from Ottawa who's a gay conservative. And he said he had a lot harder time coming out as a conservative than he had as coming out as gay. And he talked about the degree to which homosexuals were persecuted in Canada before, say, the 1980s. And it's quite, it makes quite um, harsh reading, let's say. And so, and so fair enough to the, to the, civil rights movement, let's say it, that, that has brought homosexuality into the norm or that into the mainstream. Maybe that's one way of thinking about it. But that conversation still has a tremendous amount of development that's necessary because I don't understand exactly. It isn't obvious to me what integration into the mainstream precisely means because a lot, there's been a lot of talk so far about respecting the rights of gay people but very little talk about what the accompanying responsibilities might be and that actually seems to me to be a problem and i mean i, I just had a letter from from a guy gay guy who has been wrestling with this because he's not sure how to be gay and to be ethical at the same time you know because he sees part of normative behavior as taking a wife and having children and that and can see the value in that but that's certainly not the direction of his proclivity. And so he wrote, wrote to me asking me what he should do. And, you know, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know what the answer to that is. But I know that it might be something that would be worth talking about. And, and it's part of this current confusion about sexual identity and sexual pleasure and, and well, even gender identity for that matter. So, all right, so your idea was, well, the balance between recreation and reproduction had gone, was completely absent in Sodom. It was all recreation. It was all instant gratification and impulse. Yeah, and, and that's why it's put in uh, contrast with the Abraham bit, because it, it's the same angels, yeah. but in that case, he, he says, you'll have a son this time next year. So it's, it's the reproduction part is there. But when he gets to the bottom... Right. It's not there anymore. It's only the recreation part. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. they're 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 meant to be contrasted. Those two stories. Actually, in the story of um, Abraham, <laughs> it's pretty clear. He goes. Um, I don't know if this will make sense because it <laughs> when the angels come, it, it says um, he washes their feet, and then he feeds them. Okay. That's actually the recreation and reproduction part. That, not in terms of sexuality, but it's in terms of meaning. The renewal, the washing of the feet is the recreation part, the renewal, the restarting. And the feeding is the reproduction part. Not, not in a sexual way, but when you feed something food and it eats it and integrates it, integrates it correctly, that's like a reproduction of your identity. You're, you're staying yourself, you're reproducing yourself. So when you eat food, that's what you're doing. Not, like I said, not in a sexual way, but it, it has the, exactly the same meaning. If you eat something that you can integrate correctly, you're like reproducing your pattern. It's like the correct version of yourself. And then the, the other the side... Washing, the washing, is that... Like, is that... A little flood. Yeah. It's a well, flood. It's, it's a mini flood. Right. It also... It's an acceptable... Be, right. It, it's a controlled one. You're washing the dust off your... The road's dust off your feet. It means that you're... You're passing from one mode of being into another because you're you're cleaning off the debris of the past it's something like that and then yeah, you're ready it's about renewal next yeah okay 
So you have to see that when, when, when Matthew's talking about the idea of recreation, you have to understand that recreation and rest are basically the same thing. Right. That they basically have the same meaning. It's sleeping, resting, recreation are all dying. things that, that, that bring you into renewal. Okay. Dying. Even yeah. dying. Yeah. Even dying. That's what dying is. It's, it's passing into another state. Letting something else have a chance. That's what dying is. It's, I mean... 